Welcome back from lunch. My name is Anne Kortsen, and I'm the moderator here at the Compass stage. This is the third and final day of the Build for Life conference. And during these past days, we've heard that we spend more than 90% of our time indoors. We also heard that one out of three children live in an unhealthy environment indoors in Europe, which is quite uh, concerning. And uh, we've heard from different experts, uh, scientists, professors, who all tell us that fresh air, daylight, and uh, other um, elements are key to a good life. So uh, how to solve these problems? We have now a um, presentation from three different uh, people who work in their field uh, with this um, idea of good indoor climate. What is the value proposition of good indoor climate in buildings? This is the subject for this session. And to present their work and their point of view, I have Nadim Stup, he is the CEO of PropTech. Anita Dedjanis, she's the managing director of Riva, which represents more than 120,000 engineers worldwide. And, and finally, Frederik Noltenius, who is the founder of CPH Village, which is a city development firm that works full circle. These three will each give a presentation and then we'll have a debate afterwards where you're more than welcome to ask questions. Just write whatever you want to ask in the, uh, in the window to your right. But first, it's a great pleasure to introduce Nadim Stup. Thank you, Anne. My name is uh, Nadim Stub. I'm the CEO and Managing Director of PropTech Denmark. We a, are a, an innovation hub and um, NGO for the business of real estate uh, in Denmark. <clears throat> uh, we represent uh, 160, 60, more than 160 corporate members uh, of real estate, as well as most of the technology providers and solutions that interface or deliver to real estate today. Our um, <clears throat> stakeholders represent every, the entire value chain of real estate being both on the finance, uh, financing side as well as the, all the way down to the operating side. That means that um, <clears throat> many of our key stakeholders are everything from the large financial institutions, the pension funds, the real estate owners and operators, as well as your tiny, tiny pre-revenue startup with innovative solutions uh, looking to provide new ways of <clears throat> Uh, operating real estate today. Um, we work with uh, four different uh, pillars. The first one is our community, which is focused on creating an awareness of all of the possibilities that an innovation mindset and that property technology can provide for the industry. We have the uh, fastest growing and largest prop tech lab, a uh, um, co-working space for prop tech startups. Um, and we've developed our prop tech partner program which is an innovation um, <clears throat> program for real estate incumbents where we work with them to help them understand how they can derive and create new value propositions uh, for their investors and their end users. Last but not least, we have our PropTech Academy, which is a pioneering effort to upskill the business of real estate and the people that are involved in that space. Fundamentally, we work from a premise of saying we want to build for better. Um, one of the key aspects of uh, property technology today is how it can connect the entire value chain of real estate in a whole new way, ultimately creating an as-a-service mentality. That's why things like indoor climate, light, and so on are an important aspect of that value proposition and needs to be, uh, for the industry, uh, uh, a very clear opportunity that they can commercialize in such a way that it doesn't just become, we need to create better solutions for the end users, but for it to be feasible, it needs to also be a co commercially feasible solution. Um, as I mentioned before, we work in our PropTech Academy and the business of real estate today is very much centered on what we call traditional real estate expertise. Digital and technology has 
changed a lot of things uh, out there in the world today, including all the possibilities in real estate. So we spend a lot of time trying to upskill um, the industry in uh, all of these uh, facets and at the same time help them in understanding what new types of recruitment they need to bring in in order to make sure that they understand what the future holds in their industry. Uh, you can sort of say that this is a convergence of the business of real estate, experience economy, the rapid urbanization, sustainability and technology in one. Obviously, if you look at any other industry or sector out there, that is a massive economic opportunity. And considering that real estate as a business has per perhaps eluded innovation for the best part of three decades, we are at the very, very early beginning of what seems to be a huge trans transformation and a paradigm shift in the industry and everything that interfaces around it. Um, in Denmark alone, we've seen from 2020 to 2021 more than a double in venture capital investments. And um, <clears throat> predominantly, that's actually been in what we call space as a service, i.e. the um, ability to commercialize space through tangible and intangible value propositions today. On top of that, obviously, things like sustainability, property management uh, are, are also key drivers to help that uh, change. The reason why we see this as important now for our end users is because the business of, or the landscape itself is changing fundamentally. Um, in Denmark, we have this graph by PwC, and uh, they pretty clearly show that uh, within the next five years, more than 60% of the workforce here are going to be what we call native digitalists. And that means that the problems they solve are going, the way they solve problems are going to be fundamentally digital on one hand, and on the other hand, their expectations to what their built environment provides them in terms of experience, in terms of productivity, in terms of health, is going to change a lot. Um, the way we see this entire market changing is through six different pillars. And this is what we work with all of our members, is understanding you know, how is technology going to help the operations, uh, the business operations with a sustainability purpose? How do we do real estate technology programming to help accelerate that adoption? Uh, the importance of thought leadership positioning rebuilding the entire workforce from a much more modern perspective and applying new business models um, that are more in tune with how we as consumers consume today. And last but not least, all that requires a whole host of new technologies and startups to help drive that change. So fundamentally, we, we work from a premise that it, buildings are no longer just there to satisfy needs. It's not just the outer shells of where we live. Buildings need to serve more than just um, <clears throat> um, manage the needs that we have as residents. It needs to actually create desires um, because those are going to tap into all of the demands that, that the end users are going to see today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nadim. And please uh, have a seat for the discussion afterwards. Thank you for your presentation. And um, after Nadim Stup, we now have Anita uh, Janice, she's the managing director at Reva, and she will also give here her point of view on this uh, element of uh, value proposition of the good indoor climate. Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and thank you very much for the invitation to the last very exciting day of, uh, of the conference. I'm Anita Derjanec. I'm representing an association of building service engineers at European level. And I would like to share with you our kind of take or considerations when we talk about the value proposition and how to define it for uh, healthy buildings. Uh, if we talk about healthy buildings, we can't uh, say this without mentioning COVID first, so the, what the lessons of COVID learned us, at least about our buildings. Uh, uh, it's uh, because it's teaching us actually uh, one for lesson for building designers and operators that uh, our buildings failed pretty much to, to provide safe places and, and especially clean and uh, fresh air uh, in many, many cases. And uh, we, can, we can improve that for sure. 
Uh, so I know that there will uh, there were there were discussions about this already, but uh, this is uh, the first takeaway that we would like to see more in the, in the value proposition, also in a, in a let's say evidence based way, how we create actually the, the healthy envi indoor environment, and that's uh, uh, basically this uh, slide that we I want to show you. Reva is basically uh, supporting uh, the development of new technologies, research and also knowledge exchange uh, between our members. So uh, that's what we can do here, uh, not, uh, not the actual uh, uh, proposition or selling, uh, selling the technologies. Uh, and if we talk about healthy buildings, of course, uh, you can see that that's, um, uh, that's clear and well known for our sector uh, where we uh, start from. So how to define what is healthy indoor environment? Because what we see is that in many cases, uh, uh, the per operational performance is not there. So even if we, if we think that the building is, is healthy, uh, it turns out that at the end of the day, it, it is not. So we have, uh, we have the, the, the four main, main in parameters, we talked uh, the three days uh, about this a lot uh, of, of healthy indoor environments. There is a European and international standards, and engineers like standards. Uh, how to how to define and actually make sure that uh, uh, the, the, at, at the end uh, it is uh, the value is there what we are proposing and we are looking for ways how to introduce it in a way for the market for real estate sector uh, and uh, also the the end users uh, to make it happen in a, in an understandable way because it's a complex issue and a very technical issue so I just want to point out one of the European research projects uh, we participated in. Uh, with the tech, uh, Danish Technological University and other project partners that uh, have uh, developed this uh, so-called Aldren indicator in line with, with all these parameters we have, where they try to make sure that uh, it's also like a traffic light or, or type of, of uh, colored vari uh, variation of these four, uh, four main parameters, uh, which was actually a, a performance-based uh, indicator for renovation projects. It meant that after the a building uh, went, underwent uh, deep energy renovation, they measured these uh, parameters. And now what they are working on is actually to develop these uh, uh, predict called predictail, uh, marketing is still yet uh, to be improved, uh, about how to simulate, how to predict in advance before we do uh, a renovation, deep renovation project, the impact of deep renovation on indoor environment, uh, and it can consider different scenarios using different uh, existing simulation tools well known by designers. So how to design from the start for making it healthier, either a new build or in this case a renovation of the building, and uh, we are yeah we are pretty much looking for it to be ready, and it is interoperable with existing building certification schemes uh, uh, if if needed, and also with the existing standards. So that's something uh, we we consider very important, especially because I want to just highlight one of the policy regulatory requirement being an EU level association. We deal a lot with EU policies. Uh, there is the renovation way, which hopefully everybody uh, from the European audience have heard of, uh, which should mean the re to renovate uh, actually in the coming decades uh, up, up to 35 million buildings with some social aspects and focusing on, on, the, on the, let's say, worst performing ones uh, and, and uh, vulnerable uh, uh, societal groups like and public buildings. So we really need, uh, the, yeah, we see the need for these uh, uh, let's say, uh, change of the discourse and how we work together, what kind of innovation we need also, not on technical side, but on the process side as well. So uh, especially the, let's say, trans, uh, uh, trans uh, societal collaboration with all the actors, not only the, the building professionals, so that we make it happen that we invest so much money and energy in renovating deep energy renovation of the European building stock, then we make it in a way that it uh, delivers healthy indoor environment at the same time. And that, uh, just, just to highlight, we have a lot of challenges, of course. We know the, the climate challenge, the political, the societal challenges uh, the, of the urbanization and the way we live. And uh, what we can do again is to, is to strive for this uh, trans and cross-disciplinary cooperation uh, with, with many different sectors uh, and also good uh, cases that uh, are presented in this panel today. Uh, to make it happen and to talk to each other and to make sure that the high quality and sustainable 
all buildings uh, uh, become uh, at the same time uh, healthier uh, for our indoor environment. And just yeah, for our side to walk the talk, uh, what I would like to um, announce uh, or re announce here because I know that it was already mentioned in the conference is a new competition that we launched with Velux in cooperation with Velux, uh, where we exactly try to do the same. So we take the, this uh, a very challenging plot and the environment in Rotterdam. It's a new idea competition. Uh, uh, in, a, in a current football uh, area, but it's an industrialized zone with air pollution, close to the water, with uh, potential resilience issues and flooding uh, in a highly, uh, highly dense uh, urban environment. And we ask their uh, students and young professionals in two categories to design a, a multi-apartment uh, building as a new build, uh, which is an idea competition, so not a real, uh, real construction project at the end and uh, uh, comply with certain parameters and criteria regarding indoor environmental quality, sustainability, and uh, circularity. So I hope to see many of the participants there, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nita, uh, for your presentation. Please come and sit here next to Nadim. We'll have a, a talk in a little while. You represent a very different uh, sectors so uh, i think we have i have questions for both of you but uh, before we will just uh, i'll just introduce our last speaker he is uh, the founder a co-founder of copenhagen village frederik noltenius <laughs> forward to a good discussion. Um, my name is uh, Frederick Busk. I am the co-founder of Copenhagen Village and we're a Copenhagen-based uh, startup doing student housing. Uh, I'll get a little bit more back to how we do it. Um, so uh, next slide. Ah, great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> cool. So uh, basically, uh, we founded our uh, company out of a which uh, to, to solve problems. Um, and what we're doing is uh, figuring out how to build uh, sustainably. Um, we're doing student housing and our uh, way to do it uh, sustainably in all three dimensions is to uh, figuring out ways to build uh, more compact private space and more rich shared spaces. So um, basically what you see here is an example of, of how we do the interiors of our student homes. Uh, we think very much in terms of cubic meters instead of square meters. And we think very much in terms of creating rich outside spaces. This is interesting in the sense of reducing the environmental footprint also uh, lowering rents and also creating the opportunity to, to create more community. Um, so our simple idea when we started was to uh, create life in the idle areas of the city here in Copenhagen. Um, as we work more into this, we see a great potential of starting out new areas of the city with this kind of cities as a service concept where we pop up uh, housing and create life in new areas of the city. Uh, this is our first project out in Refsalo in, in, in Copenhagen, where there's 164 students living uh, since 2018. Right now, where we are is that we are producing student housing, which is about 70% um, lower in carbon emissions per person than standard student housing. We achieve this by building mostly in wood, but also, uh, which I, I touched upon before, doing more uh, compact private spaces and more shared spaces. Um, also, we are achieving to have 20% lower uh, rents uh, than the market average. Um, we're striving to reduce this uh, a bit more, and I'll get back to uh, how we're doing this. Because basically what we've been doing since we started the company is uh, failing. 
over and over again. Uh, none of us, uh, when we started the company, are, uh, are, are let's say, experts uh, from, from the building sector. Uh, we stumbled into to doing uh, housing because the environmental footprint was so great here, and we saw uh, a need to do uh, approach of, of, of city building uh, in a different way. We saw social segregation. We saw also that, that rents was on the rise, and basically was boring living in cities. So we got attracted to this, but we had no, uh, none of the fundamentals in place, and we started out uh, uh, dead poor, so we couldn't buy uh, a lot of help. Uh, but uh, slowly, by starting as ignorance and uh, asking for a lot of advice, uh, we have s slowly and but steadily built, built a, a, a company here. Uh, and. What this has taught us, not being ex experts, is, is basically just to, to do this failing as a method. And, and also, it has taught us that we need to control the full value chain of the company uh, to learn from our mistakes. Um, I brought this uh, slide uh, for you to see that um, this is, up until now, the first five iterations of how we build student housing. Um, so, all of our housing, and, and this is quite an essential part, and I forgot because I'm a bit nervous, but uh, all of our housing is built flexible in the sense that it can move. So, it can change shape in the ideal world, but it can also move. So, we pop up in a new area of the city, and we stay there for uh, a temporary uh, period, and then we move. Uh, the dwellings in the same shape or new shapes to new areas of the city. And this has been the basic idea from the get-go. That was how we could get access to land. So instead of buying it, uh, the, the method was to rent it. Uh, the, that was the method of the poor. And, uh, but it, it, it showed that it was possible. Um, and this is our five iterations. And Along the way, uh, we figured out methods to, to reduce the carbon footprint and reduce the price quite a lot, but with many learnings and, and failings on the way. Um, we call this uh, iteration number five, a good example of how we fuck up all the time, because it's actually iteration number six. We forgot one <laughs> in this slide. But, uh, uh, this is what we can do because we control the full value chain. We've, when we started the company, we were mostly interested in uh, the, the, the sustainability of the housing block in itself and thinking of how can we build more flexible and uh, also accept the condition that we don't know the future. So how can we build in ways that our housing mass uh, can change? But then when we actually had a product that someone wanted to buy, we figured that we were actually not willing to sell it. Uh, because it was far too important what ha happened afterwards. So we changed our business model and after not only doing the design and uh, the building, but we are also moving into the operation part. So right now we are operating 150 more or less student housings. We'll have uh, a thousand next year and, and we strive to have two and a half thousand in a year after that. But what this gives us access to is to constantly collect and analyze data through our uh, inhabitants, people living with us, they share data, and we're very grateful for that. And for that, we can update and improve the con uh, our product constantly. Um, we try to do this uh, constantly with a look on accepting planetary boundaries, and, and you see this uh, bears a lot of resemblance with the donut model as well. Um, and maybe we can talk about that. Um, yeah, so. So basically, this gives us access to improving our product, so we measure how happy people are, and we figured that actually a lot of what makes people happy is what happens outside of their house. And we let people change that themselves with tools from us, and very uh, effortless, actually, just with people's time, um, we change the net promoter score almost by 25% by asking people and figuring out how, what makes their life nice, what makes a, a good neighborhood. Um, so, so this is where our short-term vision is. We want to create life for 2,500 students. And from that, we want to test if we know and we learn some things that we can generalize. If we do that, we want to export um, this way of building to the rest of the world.
Thank you. Thank you, Frederik. Very interesting. Please have a seat. Um, well, I think the um, first question, which I guess all three of you could answer, is um, you, you, you talked about uh, when you got into this that you wanted to sort of, it's an annoying word, but you wanted to disrupt the way we built. Uh, and uh, and you, you started out with these recycled containers and you moved over to wooden houses and so on. How about the indoor climate? Have you measured that? Because that's uh, what PropTech is also about, is uh, monitoring and, and giving people, the, the native uh, digital people that are the ones living in your houses, giving them the tools to, uh, to set the parameter for the indoor climate. Have you, have you thought about this? Yeah, definitely. So, so uh, when building uh, more compact spaces, of course, uh, daylight, but also just a nice indoor climate in general, uh, air quality becomes key. Yeah. Um, and also when building more compact, I think the value proposition must be then, then the indoor climate has to be actually better. Mm. Uh, so we have built in uh, apparatus after apparatus in our walls that measure indoor climate and temperature always during the day and, and also because and, and, and knowledge from us has been that windows is, is big and nice uh, and it's nice with a lot of indoor for the, for the daylight but it can get awfully warm. Yeah. So there is actually uh, and asking people where is the balance because basically the architects don't know it's the people who are living there that knows right. So so figuring out what is actually the right ratio of a window in a room is, mm. is something that we can only do with the people living with us. But we measure all the time. Yeah. So so you use the inhabitants as sort of test test people. Yeah. No, no one can know but them. Maybe the engineers can. Yeah. And so what do you think of this idea of uh, taking, for example, recycled containers and making them into um, to, uh, student housing? Yeah, that, that would come uh, first to my mind how you mean short term or comfort because that container was not built necessarily for living in there. Uh, and yes, I agree. So there are technologies, but of course, uh, I'm, I'm even to simulate that the one that I just presented, there are tools uh, but uh, that, that used by engineers, for example, to calculate the ratio of, of, uh, of windows or what, in, what impact it will have on the thermal, uh, thermal comfort uh, and the same for light, daylight. Uh, so I think it's a challenging, but, but uh, we need these in, in ideas and to make them, if they reach the market, so if you fail quick enough to, to, have, to develop uh, the products at scale, uh, it's an excellent idea to, to use materials uh, that we already used for something, so recycle them. Mm -hmm. But what do you think of the idea of sort of, as Fredrik says, just doing it and then testing it out on the people living there? Uh, I, that's an interesting question. I don't think uh, you can do anywhere else than in, in, in student housing, uh, because you. If you, uh, it depends, uh, of course, what, what you do. Uh, but if you invest money, that you can't follow the, in, in, in an own, own building. Uh, you can't follow this uh, same, same uh, method. Uh, but uh, maybe we should ask uh, how, how many complaints you had <laughs> or what the students thought mm. about this. Mm. But I'll just ask Nadim, because what do you think of this um, idea of Copenhagen Village both being the ones building, but also being the ones who sort of are the, the, ten, the, the t tend to the, the tenants and, and sort of a full circle, because uh, I guess that, that goes well with your idea of, of space as a service. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, that's right. I think where we are, we see a future where the fragmentation within the value chain of real estate is going to diminish. We're going to have far more what we call fully vertically integrated real estate players, i.e. players that are not just going to invest in assets, but are going to take the full responsibility mm. throughout the value chain and potentially also throughout the entire life cycle. Yeah, we heard that from home.earth yesterday it, it, as well. It, exactly, and, and yeah, that, that's, that's an excellent example. Um, and I think from the, the approach that they're taking, that is the future. Uh, iterative design and iterative development is the way we need to move forward. Real estate and construction are limited because historically speaking, you know, we build something, it's there for a hundred years and yeah. architects tend to have this, we're going to build this and then 
we'll go do something else, but we'll start from scratch. <laughs> as if we didn't learn anything from the first time we built. Um, but if you look into the, um, the tool set, the capabilities that technology and digital is giving us, this is the way we need to move forward. We also know that you know, we need to renovate buildings and not just rebuild buildings from, yes, a, as Nita said, from, yes. from a sustainability point of view. Yeah. Um, so it's extremely important that we have an approach where we're learning from the people and the occupants that are using these buildings. I don't know how they're doing it at Copenhagen Village, um, but what I will say is I commend them for, for doing it in, in general. And when you say that this is the way it's going to go more and more, what will be, how will it change the real estate market or the way we think about real estate? Because you said in your presentation there hasn't been any innovation in real estate for a long time. So now something is happening. Yeah. So how is it going to change the whole idea of real estate? Well, I think so you sort of to, to really dumb it down, you can say, you know, real estate is about people investing in an asset and hoping it's appreciating. And a big, big part of that business model is how are we collecting rent ongoingly? Mm. Now, that is 10 years from now, I think that's an obsolete model. Yeah, that is going to be part of the business model. But an, an additional part to that is all of the service elements that are going to be added to the business of real estate in general. And obviously, as, as businesses tend, will start to cater more towards service, mm -hmm. the development of a brand is going to be much more important. So Of a real estate brand. Yeah, or, 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 or a consumer brand, actually. Mm -hmm. right? So I think most people, they don't stop up and go, oh, I know this real estate brand. You know, it's not like... Google or Apple or Facebook. Exactly, they live uh, in, in yeah. silence. But if you go back two, three years, I think most people heard of WeWork. Mm -hmm. And WeWork was probably the first real estate mm -hmm. brand out there. And now we see a change that more and more businesses or real estate players are moving towards that. Mm -hmm. And that's because the brand is going to be important. And from a branding perspective, if you want to build a good brand, you need to own the entire experience from the start to the end. Mm -hmm. And that means that the vertical integration, the, the, the ownership of delivering the service and catering to the tenants becomes very much more important. And as yeah. a result, we need to own much more of that experience mm -hmm. and take the risk that comes with it as well. Mm -hmm. Frederik, I have a question here. Uh, actually, I have two questions for you. One is um, interesting concept. Do you only build for students and why? Yeah, well, uh... <laughs> and I think that could be part of the answer. <laughs> to... <laughs> well, <laughs> to I, what... get, uh, I can answer it in a not, uh, uh, not that. I can answer it in a funny way and in an honest way, but I'll try to do both. Yeah. So, so basically, um, when we started our company, we um, set an adventure on, on building uh, student housing because that was where the greatest problem were at yeah, the time we, in we the needed, housing market. We needed student housing in yeah, so, so basically that's our philosophy. We have, uh, we, we uh, should, if we have, should have a place in the market, it's because we saw, are solving problems. Mm. So that was the most, uh, mm. where uh, it made sense to start. Then when we said along the way, we figured that, uh, that we could uh, use this concept uh, within the existing framework, the existing planning law. Uh, however, we found out that we could not. No. So we had to change the law on the way. Okay. And in that process, it uh, became very clear it could only be student housing. So we got very because much Because of the fixated. planning law? Because of the planning law, we, if we were to get a new law, uh, that, that <laughs> fitted our business, it had only to be for students. Uh, so that is why. But also students are in a very interesting group to target because they are willing to share data. Mm. And also they are, if they do not like where they live, they are very willing to find somewhere to live elsewhere. So, so basically a student lives uh, at a student house for in, in general for one in a, one year and three months in Copenhagen. Okay. So there is a very big turnover of mm. students. So it's a very good group to ask questions from and test things on. Yeah, However, they're, the they're testing, native I must say, uh, digitals, as uh, Nadine, they're probably exactly. good at, at sharing data. Exactly. Mm. And also, uh, I must say, the, everything we're doing is within the, the limits of, of the limits of uh, the, the building regulation. Mm. So we're not uh, doing illegal stuff. Or <laughs> uh, <laughs> However, we are not uh, risk averse. No. Uh, no we uh, want to uh, test Very things. clearly not. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Um, there's also a question is, why did you dump the containers and start working with wooden constructions instead? 
Yeah, uh, so um, when we did the containers at first, it was because uh, my co-founder and I uh, uh, basically thought it was super smart because it was an upcycle product. Yeah. And uh, it reminded us a bit of Lego, and that was uh, more or less how much we could apprehend from architecture. So, so <laughs> that's all you need to. Yeah. <laughs> so that was mm. that was how we got going there, and but we also thought and intuitively made uh, sense uh, to start a discussion about uh, raw materials and uh, about sustainability in general. Mm. So that was why we got started with the upcycling of shipping containers. However, when we started. Uh, digging into it and started a production and build our first uh, settlement, we figured that it's actually hard to do in scale. Hmm. So we built what we think is, is a very nice settlement. The people is happy to live there. However, it's really hard to scale up. There is because not, there are not enough containers? There's not enough producers hmm. who can do it uh, and who okay. have, has experience with it. Okay. And if our business model is to scale, we need to figure ways to do it. Also, we thought that wood is very interesting to build in as well. Mm. We wanted to test it in our second village, mm. and we found out that actually we think it's a superior way to build modular and, and flexible housing. Yeah. So we stuck with that. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it's a, do you think, uh, uh, Nadim said that real estate is changing over to this uh, full circle service. Do you think it could be a, a value proposition to have a healthy indoor climate uh, for a real estate owner that you, if you, as Nadim says, and you, Nadim, you can join in, but as if you have to be like a brand and it's a whole different ball game, do you think that something that is normally completely um, invisible for us, which is indoor quality, you mentioned bo both thermal, but also acoustics and, and uh, the, the air, do you think it should be a value proposition? Yes, absolutely. And there are actually, uh, I'm sure, existing ones. Uh, our, our concern is rather whether they are real. So whether they really deliver what, what, the, what the stamp says or whatever certification says. Uh, so absolutely. And we, that's what we see also in the COVID, uh, well, let's say the hope that the transformative uh, role of global, uh, mm. global crisis mm. will help us because now people change their way. How, may, maybe the lifestyle is also changing how much we spend at home and, and how the function functionalities of indoor uh, uh, environments will change. Uh, plus, we see, so we see it really unfortunate, that's why we are sitting now here, not in a, in a live conference, that we, we have to provide, for example, clean and uh, air and ventilation. Mm. If it's not possible with, uh, let's say, passive solutions, then we have to, so have to figure out the way how to do that. So absolutely, and that indicator I mentioned actually it's something that w it could be an easy. Of course, you need uh, f uh, engineers or, or pro te professionals for for using and simulating that. But that could be a good uh, solu uh, yeah, supporting tool to take solu uh, decisions of what uh, I will renovate and how mm. in, in an existing building. Because that's an, another very good point that we have to focus on existing buildings. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I think. I mean, I think also you know, in terms of the adoption rate on these things. You know, when it comes to uh, grand investments into to buildings, especially there, there is a very clear distinction between the residential and the office space. And the cell is also much simpler, mm. i.e., you know, if, if you can convince the um, <clears throat> a business in an office building that better indoor climate is going to raise e effectiveness and productivity by one, two, three, ten percent, you know, that's something <laughs> the financial department can look at and say, okay, there's a return on investment there. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Mm. Um, so for the real estate owner or operator, you know, it becomes a different sell. The metrics are very clear right there. But we as people, we tend not to look at its metrics in terms of our own, or these are sort of metrics, in terms of our own personal investments. So I don't, I personally, I don't know people who would go and say, oh, I'd like to pay 10% more in rent per year because I know it's going to give me 12% more productivity at home when I'm cleaning my house. Hmm. But obviously, as these things evolve, those are going to be the trickle-down effects. It's going to be cheaper to make buildings more, you know, the indoor climate in buildings um, more efficient and, and easier to adopt. Uh, so it will start in the commercial sector and slowly move into the residential sector. But as you said, we need to have the proof in the pudding first of all. Mm. And not just saying it without it being yeah. completely <clears throat> true. But I'm just thinking that, and I never thought about this, but if I was were to 
uh, buy or rent the place, and I, I were told that the air and the daylight and everything in here and the acoustics will make you like 20% more efficient or give you a much better sleep at night and so on. It's actually, it could actually make a difference. We haven't, we, but we haven't used it as a value proposition before. Um, I have a question. I think it's probably mostly for you, uh, Nadine, but your others can, can join in. It's from Nina. She writes, hi. How do you find that national regulations either help or complicate the process of thinking innovative in regards of building, owning, and managed properties? I, I, well, <laughs> the, the political answer, I guess, is it doesn't really help. But you know, that's how it is. You know, innovation will always be far ahead of regulation. Um, what I think. Instead, there has to be a, a bigger emphasis on how do we streamline uh, the, the regulative approaches so that we can adopt innovative practice much much faster. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to sit here and share how to do it because actually I have no clue. I have a lot of respect of people that try to navigate in those treacherous waters. Mm -hmm. um, but there is no question that it is something that needs to change. Mm. And whether that be from an indoor climate perspective or from a sustainability of per, uh, perspective, we need to change it fast. Mm. Frederick, you just mentioned briefly uh, the, the national planning law, which mm. we're sort of not not uh, compatible with your idea. Yeah. So what, what did you do exactly? Um, well, um, we, we, we tried to, to find uh, basically a sweet spot where everyone could, uh, could see themselves in it. So, so basically we're a private company, so, and that helps if you don't need public money for your solution. Hmm. And then we got all the big unions, uh, all the student organizations, the big employers, the big companies uh, to, to join us hmm. in a call for changing the law, because it, basically it made sense for everybody to use these idle areas uh, for student housing. And, and we're doing it again right now, because there's a revision of the planning law. And, and actually, I, this is Denmark, of course, and this is an extreme example, but for our little company, it is crazy that we can get access to politicians. We, it's basically just giving politicians a call and you get a meet. But that's uh, where it's, that is it's an advantage for you. You said you started out being ignorant. You were ignorant yeah. in the building business, yeah. but it's an advantage for you. You have an education in politics from the University of, of Copenhagen, and there's an advantage for you where you're not ignorant. Sure thing. Sure thing. <laughs> that was uh, maybe the sole benefit. Uh, <laughs> I think there are <laughs> but, more benefits. But, uh, but, but I, think, I think in terms of legislation, there is more, more is possible than, than you might think mm. uh, in terms of the building, uh, building regulations. Mm. So you should go into the treacherous waters? As I think so. I think uh, they, uh, that is our experience, that they love to hear from people who actually know what they're talking about. Okay, great. Uh, That's a good advice. Just <coughs> give them a call. Give them a call, yeah. Mm. yeah. And you say I have a, a question for you here. Uh, in your opinion, what stands the most in the way of creating healthy homes and good business? It's a big question. Well, healthy homes first is maybe lack of awareness as well as we, as we said today we, we, we don't see the what is not it's not an easy easy subject uh, and uh, if, if and every individual takes its own uh, investments decision uh, that's, that's a completely different thing so there we have to educate a lot. I, uh, it's very interesting this integrative role of the real estate sector. Yeah. I, I'm not uh, much an expert, but how it can go into the actual housing uh, to, to help because you need a lot of support as an individual. So that that uh, could be an option. And then housing, of course, is a different um, different area. So there, it's it's easier. It's a scale there, and and there are uh, operators uh, or uh, in, in the in the line that that could help. Uh, I also think that it's not easy f without regulation. So we, we also advocate always for building codes f regarding indoor environmental quality. Uh, so and you mentioned this European standard. Yes, and, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an old one. And, uh, it's too old. Yeah, yeah, I mean, renewed a couple of years ago and it exists. And I know that uh, designers use standards also. There is a standard for daylight uh, design. So architects also are aware of, of, of many, many standards. Uh, and this is uh, for into, indoor environmental quality uh, yeah, performance for, for the engineers. Uh, 
and input parameters. So there, there are ways, uh, but you need a professional for that. So that's not the business side. That's the, the person that is designing now mm. for the home. You don't mm. need such uh, an engineer to design. It's more complex buildings. So mm -hmm. I, I, the question is for homes. And, and the other thing, the service like uh, clim indoor climate as a service, that mm. could be a good, uh, good uh, product, let's say. And we have the gadgets now for the IT development. So again, monitoring, you can monitor certain aspects of, of it uh, right now. So we have to educate what does it mean and how can I, co what if it's my red, what can I control and how can I control it? So, so it's coming, I think, and, uh, and uh, yeah, we need this big integrator. So if it will be Google yeah. or if it will be like um, uh, manufacturers, because they are looking into these manufacturers of ventilation air conditioning systems, mm -hmm. That's a, that's a question, but I tend to believe that it's rather the, the mainstream IT uh, providers that, that will end up with these smart mm. homes that can also take care of your health. Great. Well, uh, we're out of time, but thank you very much for your participation in this uh, really important and very interesting uh, talk about our future homes and the way they're driven. Thank you very much, all three of you.